Well, this afternoon and evening, we're going to talk a little bit about infectious disease. And this is a topic that should be important to everybody, you know, really in the world. Um, and we're going to do that through a vehicle of something that happened to uh, us, my wife and I, when we were stationed at Fort Detrick, Maryland. And that was an outbreak of e the first outbreak of Ebola here in the United States. And so with that, we will go forward. So it's hard to believe that uh, in 1968, the Surgeon General of the United States, our chief, military, our chief medical officer in our country, actually said at a large meeting, it's time to close the book on infectious diseases. We've won. Well, in retrospect, that sounds pretty silly. And, but why in 1968 would he say something like that to an audience who uh, was very knowledgeable about this? In 1968, we had antimicrobials and vaccines that, that were working very, very well to help protect our health. We had hygiene and nutrition, so we were, uh, we were expanding our life, uh, our life expectancies. We had vectors were understood, and the life cycles had been elucidated. We were using DDT to help control mosquitoes in one of the, some of the most important vectors. The agricultural disease is largely controlled, so we had plenty to eat, and we could f certainly feed our populations in a very significant way. And the historic killers had been largely eradicated or controlled, things like polio, tuberculosis, TB. There's a picture of a polio ward up here. There are probably a lot of people in here who have no idea what that is. Uh, very significant diseases. And in 1968, the Biowarfare Convention, the BWC, ratification was eminent, and that's the international treaty that made it illegal to use biologic weapons on the battlefield or as weapons of war. So we can't talk about what happened at uh, the, the Ebola outbreak without talking about USAMRID. And USAMRID is the United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. And it is the Army's uh, primary uh, job there to protect, bat protect soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines on the battlefield from biologic agents. And because at this time, it was only one of two places in the entire United States that had significant biocontainment capabilities, uh, it's one of the places that would work on high hazard pathogens, the very dangerous, the most dangerous of the dangerous. So we had very specialized facilities, and I could give you an hour long talk just talking about this. But this is really at the heart of it. And what you're looking at here is a picture of a couple guys in what we call the blue suits or the space suits. And these are positive pressure suits that allow you to work in a very high hazard environment with the worst of the biologic agents in relative safety. You know, I say relative, but. Uh, Clearly, uh, the, that, that technology has been proven. So when we think about the occupational health, or the occupational medicine side of working in a place like USAMRID, this is one of the things that was interesting as far as what happened to us at Reston. This is called the Air Medical Isolation Team. And what you're looking at there is a biosafety level four capable stretcher that was designed to go outside of the United States or someplace within the United States and retrieve somebody who had been infected with one of these very dangerous pathogens. Obviously, you're pretty sick if they send an airplane with this thing to come get you. But this, this technology that these folks had, the way they had developed some of the equipment, was very useful to us when we had this very unexpected outbreak of Ebola in the United States. We did not have, uh, we being USAMRID, we did not have a deployment capability. That wasn't part of our mission. It was a laboratory operation. And so one of the things that that, that uh, stretcher allowed you to do was to take somebody into uh, an occupational medicine room that was called the Slammer. And we called it the Slammer, and if you got to visit, visit the Slammer, that wasn't a very, uh, a very uh, entertaining uh, visit. So this little cartoon you're looking at says, please don't be alarmed, Mr. Parker. But those preliminary results indicate the advisability of a few precautions. So if you're unfortunate enough to get into, into the Slammer, that's exactly what the people who would take care of you would look like. They would be wearing these sorts of suits. Now, Nancy and I worked there for a long time. And uh, after much consideration, we decided that if you wake up some morning and these guys are taking your temperature uh, dressed up in these suits, that's probably bad. And I can for certain tell you that if these doggy doctors are looking at you uh, in these suits, that's really bad. But all joking aside, it's serious business. This is a biosafety level, this is a biosafety level four capable morgue. Not used much, but certainly that capability is important if you're working with the kind of organisms that are part of the deal there. So we'll talk about what happened at Reston. You know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, it's completely different than it is now uh, these days. At that time, 
Well, you know, I can't read this. It was a dark time in the world of infectious disease research. Grievous national miscalculations. This goes back to Surgeon General Stewart about the threat of biowarfare, bioterrorism, and emerging infectious diseases had gutted the U.S. research capability because we'd won, and we, and we funneled money elsewhere. And emergency plan and response capability were really non-existent. And, and uh, when we had this outbreak, uh, we really had to decide how to do that on the fly. So here's how it started out. There were some non-human primate tissues that were sent to uh, the pathology division at USAMRD, which is the division that Nancy was the chief of. And it was from a group of monkeys that had been imported in the United States, and obviously they were sick. This is a, these are lungs, and you can see the, uh, uh, the hemorrhages associated with that. Well, this is the presumptive diagnosis was that these animals were suffering from simian hemorrhagic fever, which is a very significant hemorrhagic fever for monkeys, but is not zoonotic. And so it doesn't affect humans. So there were some diagnostics done, and guess what? It popped up that there was a filovirus discovered, and what you're looking at there is a slice of lung, uh, an electron microscop a microscopic slide, and it had a filovirus in it. The presumptive diagnosis was that it was Marburg. Well, Marburg was a very serious filovirus that had killed 25% of laboratory workers in, in Germany in 1967 that had imported monkeys and used them in polio vaccine studies. So very, very dangerous disease and really uh, ramped up our, our uh, concern. But emergency diagnostics were done, emergency additional diagnostics, and it, lo and behold, it wasn't Marburg, it was Ebola. So Ebola, the outbreaks of Ebola, now we're talking about a disease that has 90% mortality and had never been seen outside of Africa before and not in, in, uh, in animals, in any kind of animals. So it was a complete surprise. And I think, as Nancy would say, this ramped up the pucker factor in a huge way uh, for us within the infectious disease research, uh, research community and certainly within USAMRID. So here was the situation we found ourselves in. We had uh, Ebola infected, was, had been confirmed in a non-human primate quarantine facility in Reston, Virginia. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, the greater DC area, this is essentially a part of the DC greater metroplex. There were about 450 cinnamogus monkeys that were in this facility. The presumption was that all of them would be infected eventually. And there certainly was potential for human exposures because people were working there, obviously. And so we did what all really good bureaucrats do when that, when that diagnosis came in. We had a big meeting. And that meeting uh, involved people from the DOD and the CDC and the World Health Organization uh, and many health departments and people from all over the place and tried to figure out what we were going to do. And so essentially what happened is because we had the most experience in the country dealing with high hazard animal work, uh, these pathogens, the task to go down and really manage this, uh, this outbreak fell to us at USAMRID. Now, one of the reasons that this is, uh, you know, we're still talking about it 25 years later uh, is because there was a book written about this. And Richard Preston wrote a book called The Hot Zone. And it was the New York Times bestseller for well over a year. And it turned out, I saw in the paper one day, that it was the 40th bestselling book of the entire decade of the 90s. Now, that's pretty good for a, a nonfiction book about an outbreak of Ebola and about Ebola fever. But what I want to talk about is the realities of response. And one of the reasons I mentioned the hot zone is because of all the interests associated with, uh, uh, with, with, these, with these issues. So in the rest of the Ebola incident, I could tell you about all the things we did right. And in fact, we have, uh, uh, especially post-infection uh, uh, workout, we talked at all of the major uh, government and health issues talking about how we managed this particular outbreak. So I could tell you all about that, but it's more fun to talk about the stuff that went wrong. So Murphy's Law raised his head, certainly, and so the kinds of things that we had to deal with. Uh, for those of you who have been on the Leesburg Pike, it's horrible. Uh, the the uh, traffic is bad. It turned out, just by luck of the draw, that we were about 50 miles from this place. So we were able to drive back and forth. There was a daycare center, believe it or not, that was about 50 yards from this facility. And obviously, having an Ebola outbreak. Now, you know, in, 19, in 1989, there wasn't one person in a 1,000 that ever heard the word Ebola. Uh, because, you know, unless you lived in Zaire, you probably would have never heard about it. So we had this daycare center that we had to deal with. And when I say we, I'm talking about our uh, public health people. Uh, 
We had an HVAC malfunction, and that's heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And so the second day we were there, our heating, our, uh, the ambient temperature in the facility went up into the upper 90s. We were wearing these spacesuits, and of course they're not air conditioned, they're just filtered, air filtered. Uh, very, very significant safety, safety issues for our people that participated. But the thing that really turned this from what we thought was going to be about a three or four day deal into a full week was the fact that some of the animals weren't, uh, weren't in squeeze cages. Now, squeeze cage is a device uh, for a monkey cage that has a false back, and you flip a couple switches and you can bring the animal to the front, and we have some very efficacious uh, anesthetic agents that you can inject uh, into their thigh. And so within a couple of minutes, you can handle one of these animals uh, very, very carefully. Well, if you don't have a squeeze cage, you, you don't have a whole lot of, uh, you know, you don't have a whole lot of options except reaching in with a big glove and grabbing these monkeys. Now, I've caught a lot of monkeys that way. I don't ever like to do it under any circumstances. But if they have Ebola, you really don't want to reach in and grab them. So we had to come up with some very significant uh, high-tech sort of uh, way to deal with this. And this was our, uh, this was our strategy. So the guy on, the, on, uh, the guy on your right has a, has a mop handle. And what we did is we wrapped that with, uh, with a towel and then put tape around it, and so it was sort of U-shaped, and you would try to pin the animal into the, uh, uh, into the back of the cage. And you can see these cages. You'd have to get on your hands and knees on the lower ones, and you have to stand on a ladder on the upper ones. Try to pin the monkey, and then the guy on, the, uh, on your left, he has a pole syringe, which is about a four-foot four pole that has a needle on the end of it with anesthetic, and then you try to anesthetize the, the monkey. Well, you know, long story short, very, very difficult to do. Some of the cages had two monkeys in them, uh, which complicated things considerably. And of course, we were very concerned about safety. And the biggest thing we were worried about is that we'd have a monkey get loose. Sure enough, Murphy's Law uh, raised its head, and we had a monkey get loose in one of these animal rooms. So after Richard Preston wrote his book, there was a movie made about this, uh, uh, loosely based on this event, loosely. <laughs> so in that movie, they had an outbreak of a hemorrhagic fever from, uh, from Africa, uh, thinly veiled as Ebola, and it was killing very uh, significant numbers of people on the, on the West Coast. So they finally figured out that it was probably a monkey that was carrying this, this uh, disease. And so they went on TV, one of the, the, uh, one of the heroes, and he says, anybody seen the monkey? Well, sure enough, there was a lady who'd been cleaning her daughter's room that morning, had seen a little picture she'd drawn, and he said, you know what? I think that looks like the monkey. I think, she's, I think she saw the monkey. She calls the guys up and said, I think my daughter must have seen the monkey. So they flew up in the helicopter. They went out in, in on her back deck. They threw a couple apples on the deck and hid in the bushes. Sure enough, out of this redwood forest comes this monkey, starts eating the apples. They shoot it with a capture gun, jump in the helicopter, fly back to where all the people are dying. They take this little monkey that's about the size of a Scotty, and they take enough, enough immune serum to fill several tanker trucks full of uh, immune serum and they treat everybody at the place and they save the world. So here's the real, that, that's the Hollywood army. Here's the real army. We had a monkey get loose in a, in, a, uh, in a room that was about 30 feet long and about 15 feet wide. And me and two of my guys chased this monkey all day long for an entire day. <laughs> Never had a chance to get away. He was, uh, you know, he was scared of us as he probably should have been. And we were, you know, we weren't scared, but we were concerned about him. And so that, my friends, is the reality of response. The Hollywood version is what our people want. That's what they expect of the government. That's what they expect of our, of our research folks. But unfortunately, this fiasco we had is much, more, is much more realistic. So this is a picture that I took in the facility. And the three guys you sort of see up the center, those are Army Veterinary Corps officers. Uh, and I want you to take a look at the people on the sides, because these are, uh, these are Army enlisted animal technicians. And you know, the, you know, our military is full of people that you should be proud of. And when you see them, you ought, to, you ought to say hi to them and give them a pat on the back. They don't pay those enlisted people hardly anything. And so I think it's important to, uh, you know, to appreciate what they do for you. Well, the thing about rest and Ebola, it turned out that nobody got sick. We thought we were dealing with Ebola Zaire the entire time. What we found out, though, after the, after the event was over, that the five people who worked in this facility, the people that worked for this contractor, that they became, four out of those five became infected with Ebola. Uh, 
So had this been Ebola Zaire, had this been the disease that killed nine out of 10 people, those people would have probably been dead and many of their friends. What about our people? We had 42 people that were part of the deal and not one person got sick. So all the things that we did were right. And I think that translates to what I hope to touch on, which is what happened in, uh, you know, in, South, in, South, in West Africa this year. So what did we learn at Reston? We learned that emergency planning, teamwork, and leadership works. We learned that uh, the right PPE works, that's protective equipment. We know that it works because of what happened there. And uh, we know that leadership works. Well, what did we learn in the outbreak that happened in the United States? Well, we can't ever take anything for granted. And you know, multiple months of a deadly outbreak of a disease in another continent apparently is not enough warning for us to be prepared. And, uh, and we had assurances that it was going to do. I, you know, I, I was on network TV saying, hey, we're ready. Let it, you know, we're going to get it here. It's going to come, and we're going to be ready for it. Wrong. Completely dead wrong. And so it's very, very important that these, that these lessons that we learned, these very important lessons that we learned, they didn't really have any traction at all. And so we were really lucky that Ebola wasn't the kind of a disease that would spread easily because it's not airborne. And certainly this little cartoon uh, talks about we were just daggum lucky that it didn't, that it didn't uh, go. And we can talk about the pandemic influenza. If you want to look at it, in 1918, I think one of the important things, there, were, there was about a 30% incidence in the world. So about three, about three out of 10 people were infected. And it may have killed as many as 25 million people in 25 weeks. And some estimates are that there were 150 million people killed. And there are many factors that would make a pandemic flu outbreak really, really serious. So what's the plan for us now? Every healthcare facility in the US should uh, be, ready to, be ready to respond. And obviously, we found out that that wasn't the case. And the chances are it's not going to happen if you're, if you're living in a hospital or if you work in a hospital. But today could be the day. And that still, uh, that still goes for us. So where do we need to invest? We have to have, uh, we have, to have research facilities. And I'm going to show you a picture of the NBAF that we have here, in, the United, here in, in Manhattan in a few minutes. And we have to have places that, we're, that can uh, care for uh, uh, critical care patients. We have to have people in hospitals. We have to think through what they're going to do if they were to happen to have an Ebola patient or some other very significant disease walk through their door. And of course, our first responders have to be prepared, and they have to understand PPE, and they have to have it, uh, they have to have it on board. This is the NBAF uh, that we have here in Manhattan. And this is, a, this is an example of what it is that we're doing within the United States to try to, uh, to, try to um, uh, keep up with this. So. Uh, Paul Epstein at Harvard has said, never has the uh, divide between animal and man been so porous or so, uh, or so dangerous. And things like global travel, overpopulation, overpopulation, uh, urbanization, and climate change are speeding the spread of diseases uh, from animal to man. And we're in the midst of a, of, an out, of a surge of diseases that we thought were completely conquered. And if we think back, and if we think back to what Surgeon General Stewart said, these things are all factoring into the fact that, we are not, uh, that we're not prepared. And this is just a tiny list of diseases that have become important since the Surgeon General you know, made, his, uh, made his infamous statement. So, uh, and when you overlay this, these diseases that have occurred with the fact that there are people out there who say they want to do it on purpose and have told us that they will do it if they can figure it out, that's a very, very daunting challenge for us. So, we don't really know when we're going to have a disease outbreak, and we have to be prepared to deal with that. And with that, I will close, and uh, uh, thank you very much to the organizers of this event.